Good morning and welcome back again to my studio in the basement here. Um, I have a captive audience of one who's watching me and helping me as we uh, go through this material. Uh, since we last met, unfortunately, we've had to um, go back into a non-face-to-face -face mode for our classes just to try to be as safe as we possibly can. We are continuing to worship face-to-face -face, uh, because that's just so important for us and to us. Um, and so those are, those are the conditions that we're operating under. I'll make my usual apology that this is not the format that I would prefer, but nonetheless it's, uh, it's the best we can do under these trying times and circumstances. And we're going to continue this morning in the Gospel of John. Uh, we have been looking at, we're still in chapter 1, and we've been going through the, oh, the, I suppose the beginning at verse 19 through 51 is what we've been looking at. Um, and of course, this is divided into four consecutive days. Day 1 in verses 19 through 28 are when the Jews from Jerusalem send out priests and Levites and Pharisees to question John the Baptist. And they're really challenging him, uh, letting him know that he needs to justify what he's doing out there. Uh, but they're taking notice of him because he's making a lot of disciples. And there's, a, there's something brewing out in the wilderness here, and they're aware of it. So they send their, um, their scholars and their, their people out to ask some questions of him. We've talked about that at length. We're currently still looking at day number two when Jesus shows up on the scene and then the Baptist, John the Baptist, actually gives his testimony of what he had seen previously when he had baptized Jesus. And indeed, that was when he initially met Jesus, it appears. Okay, so that's where we're at now. And then over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at days three and four, uh, where Jesus begins then to make his disciples. Um, and, they tra and the ministry transitions, the chapter shows us this transitioning of the ministry focused on John the Baptist initially, but is transitioning over to a ministry that's focused on Jesus. So that's, that's where we've been and where we're headed. Um, as I said, we are currently still in day number two, which is uh, verses 29 through 34. And this is John the Baptist's testimony. I decided in order to try to keep all these J names straight that I would put a sub uh, letter next to them. So if you see a J sub B, that's John the Baptist. If you see a J sub C, that's Jesus Christ. If you see a J, and there's not one up here right now, but if later on if you see a J sub A, that's John the Apostle, or John the Author. And so that way we can keep these, these three um, straight. And I, I don't have to write out their whole name all the, all the time because, as you can tell, we don't have a lot of room on, on these pages and things. So um, anyhow, on day two, we're, going, we're listening to the testimony of John the Baptist, and we've gotten uh, halfway through it so far. We noticed that Jesus showed up on the scene, first of all. And we didn't know we don't know exactly why Jesus showed up there. Ultimately, perhaps it's because he was intending to uh, capture some disciples and recruit some disciples. So it's possible that that was the reason. But we're not told exactly why Jesus shows up on the scene. John the Baptist, when he when Jesus arrives on the scene, the Baptist immediately defers to him. And we've talked at length about the Baptist ministry being one that is secondary to Jesus all the time. And the Baptist continually reminds, I think, both himself and his audience that he's just preparing the way for Jesus to come and to be successful. And he's trying to prepare the hearts of the people and those who are listening and those who are willing to repent and change and become the type of people that God wants them to be. So we see Jesus arrive. We see John the Baptist uh, deferring to Jesus. And then we spent most of our time last week talking about this proclamation that the Baptist makes in verse 29 when he says, look, 
uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we spent a lot of our time talking about what the phrase Lamb of God meant. And, and you'll recall that that, in a Jewish person's eyes, it goes all the way back to antiquity, to the days of Abraham and Isaac, when, when uh, Abraham was commanded to offer uh, Isaac. And they began to, to carry that out. And, and Isaac that morning asked his father, well, where's the lamb for sacrifice? And Abraham's answer was, God will provide. Um, and that answer became the foundation of this, this notion of a Lamb of God that would be provided by God for the benefit of the people. Um, after we looked at that, we looked at the institution of the Passover in Exodus, and then we looked at the beginning of the, uh, the law in Exodus, and we saw first that they, they used the lamb to escape from the slavery of, uh, of Egypt, that the Lord demanded that, they, that they, everybody in Israel sacrifice, each family would sacrifice a lamb at uh, twilight, and, as the, and then that blood would be applied to their doors and, and, and uh, door jams, and as they did, then that would, uh, would allow them to be freed ultimately from their captivity and their bondage in Egypt much in the same way that years later we now see the Lamb of God providing a sacrifice that allows us freedom, but not freedom from Egypt. Instead, it's a freedom from, from, the, from the possession of Satan, but also from the, uh, uh, the, the consequences of sin. Okay, and then we looked, as I said, at the law and how in the law it was commanded that there would be a sacrifice of a lamb every morning and every evening at the entrance to the tabernacle and then later on at the temple and that was going on throughout all of Jewish history as long as the tabernacle or temple were in existence that continual sacrifice process was going on and it signified both the removal of sin from the nation and it also signified the presence of God with the nation because of its location at the entrance uh, to where God would meet with uh, with his people and then we took a look at the prophecy and how the Lamb of God was referred to especially in Isaiah 53, where um, we, read about, we read about the fact that we like sheep have gone astray, but then in the next phrase, the Bible describes Jesus also being like a sheep who before his shears was dumb, um, he uttered not, a vo not, uttered not a sound. And so um, he became a sheep because we had wandered off like sheep. And so these were some of the notions that the Lamb of God to, uh, was, was bringing up in the minds of Jews in the first century. And so when John the Baptist refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God, they would get that. But in addition to that, we took a look at the New Testament and we noticed that there are so many parallels. And of course, Jesus uh, being the fulfillment of all that foreshadowing from all the Old Testament uh, requirements in, in, in the law as well as the uh, uh, prophecies that were related to the coming of Jesus and his characterization as the Lamb of God. But then ultimately we took a look at Revelation uh, chapter 5 where recall we saw the glorified Lamb present and, and the only one who was capable and who was qualified to open the seal, the only one that could be found was a lamb looking like he had been slain. And so the, the, the whole rest of chapter 5 of Revelation then is devoted to a description of how the lamb is being worshipped in the throne room of God. And so it's a, it's a remarkable parallel. So we talked a lot about the lamb of God and then we, near the end of where we left off, we mentioned that in John the Baptist's proclamation, he also said, notice this is, the, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, not just of the family, and not just of the nation, and not just of this region of the world, it's the entire world that's involved. And so the, John's, John's proclamation reminds us that Jesus was the solution to sin for the entire world, not just for the, uh, the nation of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the nation of the patriarchs, the nation that uh, had its, its kingdoms, uh, that had its heyday back in the time of, of uh, David and Solomon. But 
in spite of all of the uh, remarkable advantages that they had been given, there's a clear shift now. And that shift is away from the focus on only uh, physical Israel being God's people to all of spiritual Israel being God's people. And now it's opened up not just to the Jewish world, but also to the Gentile world. And so that's, I think, pretty much where we left off last week. Now, we're going to pick up today with uh, verses 32 and 33. And this is actually the Baptist recalling when he had first met Jesus. And that was at the time of Jesus' baptism. John, uh, John had just said back in verse 31 that one of the reasons he came baptizing with, with, with water was so that Jesus would be made manifest to Israel and might be revealed to Israel. And then we read in verse 32, John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now that was the core message of John's testimony as to who Jesus was. Um, and, and he recalls that wonderful experience that he had, had been blessed with uh, sometime previously. This passage tells us in verse 33 that the Baptist had been already told that he would recognize Jesus when he would see the Spirit descend and remain on him. That would be the identifying feature that the Baptist would experience. And of course, in verse 32 says that's exactly what happened. And, and the Spirit took the form uh, took, the, took the very nature of a dove and came and rested and stayed on Jesus and remained on him. And we've looked a couple of times at John 3.34, but it's worth reminding ourselves there that Jesus had a, uniquely, um, uh, a unique empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And what, and what is said in chapter 3, verse 34, for the, whom, for the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. And, and for Jesus, that was, that was the special blessing that Jesus had, was the, the, the Spirit given to him without limit, remaining on him, and then empowering the rest of, the rest of Jesus' ministry. Okay. Um, and this, this brings us to a question that's often asked when people are talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. And we often ask the question, uh, remember when, when, G when Jesus came to be baptized by John, John initially refused, or he didn't refuse, but he balked. He said, uh, I don't, you don't need to be baptized by me, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus said, no, let it be so in order to fulfill all righteousness. Well, one reason that this fulfills all righteousness is because this was the way that he would be uh, introduced to the people of Israel and to the nation of Israel as the one fulfilling God's plan. His being baptized by John afforded the opportunity for those present to witness special events. Amongst them, the dove coming down, the Holy Spirit coming down as a dove, and then uh, resting on and remaining on Jesus. Okay, so the, the summary of this point is that um, the Holy Spirit here was received by Jesus, okay? The Holy Spirit indwelt Jesus. Jesus received the Holy Spirit in this situation. But what else had uh, the Baptist been told according to verse 33? Not just that the Spirit would come down and remain on him, but what else? Well, take a look there. It says, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. 
And so the Holy Spirit was received by Jesus, but it also says Jesus will dispense or distribute the Holy Spirit. You see that? So once again, the Spirit comes down and rests and remains on Jesus, but also John has been told in advance that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. He will, he will dispense the Holy Spirit. And take a look at uh, you know, Matthew 3, verse 11. Very similar statement. This is again John the Baptist speaking of Jesus. And John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We take a look then over at Acts chapter 1, verse 5. This is when Jesus is preparing to ascend back to heaven. He's speaking to his apostles. And in verse 5, he says, For John the Baptist baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So there is, this is working its way towards completion. And of course, that occurs then on the day of Pentecost. All right? And so we end up having... Two baptisms. That the Baptist speaks of. Okay, first of all, there's John the Baptist. And his baptism is a baptism of water. And it serves two purposes. Purpose number one is for the purpose of repentance. Repentance unto forgiveness. And purpose number two is for identification of the Messiah, for identification of Jesus. All right, so we have two purposes of John the Baptist's baptism. But then John, John speaks of Jesus' baptism. And Jesus' baptism will baptize with the Spirit, okay? And he will baptize with the Spirit for the purposes of bringing power to the lives of the apostles and the disciples and the faithful, and also for the process of sanctification, for developing into, and, and let, me, let me take that back. Um, the empowerment is, is brought out very clearly in the day of Pentecost and the, and the special things that, that occurred then and then continued to follow with the apostles throughout their ministries. But in addition to that on Pentecost was set into motion a process whereby the, the, Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit would be rendered available to all Christians for the process of sanctification, for the process of turning us into true children of God, for turning us into the types of the, the people with the type of character that he wants, the type of attitudes that he wants, that do the things that he wants. And, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the way that the empowerment of the Holy Spirit helps and sanctifies us um, and, and changes our lives. Um, and so it's very important that we understand the difference between these two, these two baptisms. But they come together here because John the Baptist, in the process of baptizing Jesus, recalls that part of the promise was also a baptism of the Holy Spirit that would follow later. Okay, I hope, I hope we've been able to make that clear. Now, the... Um, we mentioned when we were talking about the various themes of the Gospel of John, one of the themes was the Trinity. And, uh, and God, John sheds a lot of light upon how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit interact with one another. 
And this is a perfect example of that because we see one of the few places, this is one of the very few places in the Bible where we see evidence of all three beings present at the same time. We see, first of all, the, the Father is here. Notice in verse 33, um, John the Baptist refers to the one who sent me. And indeed, that's the role of the Father. The Father is the one who um, begins everything. He's the, he's the director. He's the one that, that ultimately is the decision maker. He's the one whose character is being emulated by everyone else. We see the Son show up in verse 33 when he says, The, one, the, uh, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain. That's speaking of Jesus, of course. And so we see the second figure of the Trinity present. And then the Spirit is present as the dove, uh, showing up in this same sequence of events. So we have all three members of the Trinity present here. But while we're talking about the Trinity, um, it's important that we recognize something's missing from the God, this Gospel account. And it's in all three others. When you, when you read about Jesus' baptism, there's something else that shows up. And I want you to think about that. What is it that shows up in the other Gospels that it, but isn't here? That's right. The voice. The voice from heaven. Remember? And as they were coming up out of the water, the voice from heaven um, said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So... Here's my question to you, and I want you to think about this for a minute. Why might the Apostle John, and of course the Holy Spirit in his direction of John, but why does he choose to identify this event more with the Spirit than with the voice? Why is he looking at the Spirit as being such a powerful witness here? Well, of course, it's always dangerous to go beyond the text. And I'm, I, I would not, please don't think that I, that I believe that this is absolute, the absolute reason. I'm, I'm probably just scratching the surface of the reason. But I do think there's at least one reason that the Spirit is so emphasized here. First of all, the world already knew the rest of the story. They already knew the story about the, um, uh, the voice by the time that John writes this down. Remember, John's writing much later than the other authors. Uh, their word has already circulated. Their stories of this event had already circulated. So the, the fact that there was a voice there was well known. But more than that, I think he's showing us where he, uh, the Apostle John is showing us where he's going next. Because where he's going next is he's going to start talking about what it is that changes a person when they meet Jesus. Okay? He's we're going to move into discipleship in the rest of the, the rest of the chapter. We're going to be talking about Jesus making his first disciples. And everything is going to shift. We're going to start talking about how people change as a result of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And 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 I think that's why John the apostle puts this out there for us is so that we can start uh, prepping for what's coming. And what's coming is the effect and the, and the impact of the Holy Spirit on the lives of people. So that's, that's where I think we're going here. And uh, this then is the conclusion of the testimony of John the Baptist about the baptism of Jesus. But he does say one more thing, and that's in verse 34. So we'll go back to our, our chronology here. And I'm going to call this John the Baptist's, what did I call it, summation. Okay, so having identified Jesus as the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the entire world, having shared the experience of being there with Jesus at his baptism, and witnessing the Holy Spirit come down and descend on him, and recognizing that Jesus would also then later on be baptizing with the Holy Spirit and dispensing the Holy Spirit, John makes a summary statement. In his summary statement in verse 34, 
is what? I have seen this and I testify that this is the Son of God. And so it's just very simply, Jesus is the Son of God because of what he had seen and what he had experienced. Now, remember, we've, we've been talking about the purpose of this gospel being written, and we keep going back to John 20 and 31, where it says, these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living, the Son of God. And here we have our first witness who has come to the witness stand. He has testified and he has given us the reasons that he believes that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. He'd been told some very specific things. Every one of those things took place just as prescribed and just as expected. And, and John the Baptist is not just, there's no flaw in his character. You don't have to worry about him as a witness. John the Baptist is one of the most important people in, the, in biblical history. In fact, Jesus said amongst those born of women, no one is greater. So it doesn't get any better than that in terms of the quality of your witness. And so the Apostle John has called his first witness to the, to the stand. He has testified and so far, you're the jury. You have to decide if you agree or not. Okay? So, um, let's summarize then what the Baptist had to say about Jesus. Number one, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Right? He was the fulfillment of all of the old that the Old Testament sacrificial system implied. Everything it was looking for was fulfilled in Jesus. Number two, Jesus would be the dispenser of the Holy Spirit by baptism, by a baptism. Okay. <clears throat> the Spirit would then both empower his disciples, but it would also serve to reform and to sanctify his disciples. Number three, the final statement, he is indeed the Son of God. That unique mixture of humanness and divinity all in one package. And I want to share with you as we close this morning a passage from chapter 42 of Isaiah. This is Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. And listen to what the prophet wrote about the servant of the Lord. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight, I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on earth, and in his law the islands or the nations will put their hope. And, and that's a pretty much a, a, a total summation of what the Baptist's experience was. He saw the Spirit put on him and he, see, he foresees this ministry, this unique ministry that's about to unfold. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see through the lives of his disciples, we're going to see just the way that Jesus impacted them and changed their character. And beginning next week now, we'll start talking about the disciples that Jesus, uh, that Jesus recruits, trains, develops, and how they uh, will eventually, we'll get to the point to how they pick up the torch. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate you being with us this morning. Uh, we'll be back uh, as often as I can, um, and we will uh, likely be at 9.30 here on Sunday mornings for a while. Um, but if we can get back in the building at some point safely, uh, I look forward to that. 
as much as any of you do. So um, be blessed this coming week. Uh, don't ever forget, God is good all the time.